Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? It's a Saturday. Hot and steamy here in the American Midwest. It's going to get into the 90s again. The humidity's been high. It's been a, a struggle, to say the least. But uh, it's, I guess first world problems. I can live with it. We got the pool out back, so uh, air conditioned bedroom, so I guess we're good. Uh, thanks to all my Patreon supporters. That's I appreciate you guys all so much. All my subscribers as well. I, I appreciate you guys. Man. I love the dialogue. I love the, the conversations, the feedback. It's a knowledgeable group out there, and uh, I'm honored to be a part of your guys' lives. So y'all know that. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about a guy who is very forefront in the jazz community, and yet doesn't get spoken of much by collectors. And that's the great George Wee, uh, born in Boston in 1925, uh, to Jewish parents. He became a piano player, learned jazz at a fairly young age. He's actually a fairly acclaimed player, but he doesn't get much credit or acknowledgement from today's collectors. And that's partly because he was very much a businessman and a promoter and a mover and shaker in the jazz world which overshadows his playing a great deal. Uh, what we're listening to right now is his early work on Atlanta. This is 1221, which makes that pretty early. Uh, the Atlantic discography, Lion, Woman, and Song, pretty fun, great cover. Pink's not a very usual choice for this era. I guess you see it some, but uh, great record. Pretty tough to find, actually. Original mono black pressing. Uh, he was very instrumental in putting jazz on the landscape and really bringing it to the American East Coast Ivy League bourgeoisie. We're going to go camp at uh, Narragansett, Martha's Vineyard, Newport, and, uh, Rhode Island, all these places, uh, Musquamacut, you know, all these kind of resorty. Uh, beachfront communities. He brought jazz to those people, which is pretty cool. And really, only Bethlehem and uh, a few other labels to be really fit in that soundscape that was very accepted in all those places. Uh, you, you weren't going to bring in the Blue Note guys to play at Newport, you know. And they did get some pretty edgy stuff in there, you know, but it wasn't certainly. Uh, the John Coltrane, Rashid Ali, Pharaoh Saunders. You know, and that set did get some play there. You know, they did. Uh, and the, 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 I think the festival's still going to this day. I think COVID might have paused it this last year. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, it's really quite a long running thing. He uh, graduates from the Boston University uh, Liberal Arts Program in 1950. I think he served in the Army a little bit. But then he right away jumps into opening up a club, which is the famed Storyville. Had a lot of great sessions on a lot of different labels recorded live stuff there, including the great Stan Getz uh, Storyville stuff from probably 53, 54. Those sessions are great if you can find those. They're tough to come by, old 10 inches. I think it's been reissued on 12 inches as well, but tough to find. So whenever you see something live at the Royal Roost, that was George Ween's club in Boston. And Storyville, like I said, it's a fairly legendary club that has a big part of the East Coast jazz scene happening in Storyville. Of course, it's a tribute name to the Storyville neighborhood in New Orleans, where Armstrong and a lot of the other cats came from in the initial days of the jazz movement. And there was a Dixieland connection, too, to Storyville. They certainly loved and promoted a lot of that era's music, which really fit the clientele of New England. And those of you who weren't from America, New England's a very different part of America. Just as the South has a tradition of its own, New England has a very different tradition of its own as well. It's very proper, and uh, there's old money, and uh, it's a very white area, to be, to be honest. Uh, Boston didn't see the wave of black migration that almost every other great American northern city did in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Boston, for all its liberality and all its uh, liberalism and 
uh, left-wing commonwealth ideology that Boston and New England's famous for, there was still a great deal of racism and resistance against black migration and opening up and having that. And of course, Boston has its own racism with the Irish, where there's quite a bit of conflict over the years with various factions between the Irish and the other settlers, Scottish and the British and whoever else. It's amazing how much the American fabric has been written in the clash between various immigrant groups and on how much so many of us forget that we are all immigrants. You know, unless your name is Chief Tonto Featherback, unless, you're, unless you've got that lineage, you're an immigrant from somewhere. And so many Americans seem to forget as they disparage that new wave of immigrants coming from somewhere that two, three generations ago you lived somewhere else. And that's why the flag of nationalism is such a distraction. It's, it's so short-sighted. Nation is not this permanent thing. It's a very temporal thing. It doesn't define you. The more you understand nations and study history, the less nations mean. They don't really define me in any way. It's where I came out of my mother. That's what my nation is. It's who I chair for in the Olympics. But there's no creed or DNA in me that has anything to do with the nation I was born in. It's a really silly hill to die on. A really silly flag to fight for. Your nation of origin just doesn't really have a whole lot of impact on who you are. And yet nationalism is a predominant way of thinking. But uh, so Boston has this interesting history. And there is some great jazz, black jazz happening in Boston. But most of the Boston scene is white cats coming up and doing some great things. But uh, George Wing's at the center of all of this. So the Storyville Club is one facet of what he does. The next facet is the Storyville Record Label, which is a label he launches by 1951. And I have almost everything. I'm missing a couple Sidney Bachet 10-inch LPs. And I'm also missing the 12-inch LP that calls that stuff together. And I'll buy them eventually. I see them from time to time. If I see them ever at a good price, I'll buy them. I'm not going to spend 100 bucks on a Sydney Bechet 10 inch. I'll wait till I find one for a 30, and I'll probably spring and buy them. Uh, they're out there. They're not that super hard to find. I love Sydney Bechet, but you can find this stuff at a better price than what I've seen it so far. Uh, the other thing I'm missing is I believe number 310 in the 10 inch sequence. Uh, it's a Serge Chaloff and Boots Mazzulli 10 inch. I think it's out live at Storyville. And I, I haven't seen it. I think when I first started looking for Storyville, I saw it on eBay. I bid not very aggressively, not knowing. And it went for three times what I bid on it. And I've not seen it again. Not nowhere to be seen. So <clears throat> I'm hoping to eventually find that Serge Shaloff and Boots was really 10 inch. It's probably one of the top. LP's records I'm looking for right now 10 inch not an LP but like I said it's just a rare piece truth be told most of the Storyville discography is not too hard to find and I'm going to show it to you right now it's about 22 10 inches and I think 17 or 18 LP's some crossover between the two and then it disappears and then a Storyville label springs up in Denmark, I think it is, if I remember, a decade or so later. And they're not really linked in any way, but they still use that name, that history of New Orleans. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a little confusion, I think, there. But then we're talking the original Storyville label, George Ween, Boston, 1950s. And just, without further ado, let's jump in. First one is one of those machets. The second one is this Teddy King and Beryl Booker. Nice little uh, 10 inch. If I remember, Beryl Booker's a black pianist. I can't remember for sure. It's been a little bit since I looked. Cool record. Uh, Burt Goldblatt does a lot of the Storyville covers. And I think he does all of the Storyville 10 inch covers, if I remember correctly. Tough to find, that one. <clears throat> Number 903. 303, sorry. Is Jazz of Storyville, George Wing, Storyville Band, with Edmund Hall, Vic Dickinson, Joe Jones, Johnny Windhurst, Ruby Braff. It's definitely a New Orleans sounding uh, great cover by Goldblatt again. Uh, 
not too tough to find that one. The big thing that stuff's always going to be a little easier to come by. This is a Japanese import of number 304. This is Lee Connitz. Uh, Connitz is a great player, bright, uh, almost acidic tone, citrusy, just kind of got a real brightness to his sound and an edge to it that will put a little something on your palate. Uh, Connitz has some fire to him. His records are becoming fairly rare and fairly expensive. And if memory serves, he passed last year, one of the greats we lost last year in 2020. Got a lovely Connitz. Uh, the great Bobby Brookmeyer, one of the great trombone players, one of the great arrangers of this era. Uh, Bobby has a long career in jazz on a lot of different labels, but he makes some pretty great recordings here at Storyville. There's a couple more to show you here. Uh, this is with the great Al Cohn, who was one of the great white sax players of this era. Uh, Cohn's sound is just, I guess, somewhat like Lester Young. Uh, and he plays in a way that a guy like Billy Holiday can be like, I dig that. You know, he's just, got, he's just very emotive. And very moody. I'm a big Al Cohn guy. He's got a big discography as well. Even Al Cohn's RCA titles are worth finding. Number 307. 306 was another one of the Cindy Bechet. 307, Jazz at Storyville. This is Mahogany Hall, All Stars, Joe Jones Quartet, Ruby Braff, Joe Jones, Vic Dickinson, Doc Cheatham, Buzzy Druton. Again, a great Burke Goldblatt line drawing. Uh, he's got several different styles of cover and design, and I'm a pretty big fan of Goldblatt. His stuff kind of jumps out at me now. Number 308, Pee Wee Russell. And Pee Wee's a great clarinetist. Uh, with me and my friend Jean-Michel yesterday, we're talking about Barney Bigger, who played with Ellington for a long time, the great Creole uh, clarinetist, who's just a fiery player. Everyone talks about Benny Goodman. Everyone talks about uh, Artie Shaw. Everyone talks about uh, Buddy DeFranco, even. People kind of forget about P.B. Russell. People kind of forget about how great a player... Sorry, I got eat water in my hair still. Uh, how great a player Barney Bigger was. But P.B. Russell is this fun guy. And all of his sessions, while they have a Dixieland edge to them, they're always fun and bouncy and full of life. I think I'll put one of his records on now. Just bouncing along. You know, it's just... From the New Orleans funeral marches to the joy of church and the parade. The world of music has a joy to it that's unmistakable. This is number 309 by Shepkin Andes. And it's a bit more of a folk thing, uh, some storytelling. It's a cool cover. Pretty tough one to find, actually. But it's not really a jazz session. This is jazz at the Boston Arts Festival, so everything has a very Boston edge to it. Number 311, Ruby Braff, Samuel Margulies. Buzzy Druton, Vic Dickinson, Al Druton, uh, George Ween plays the piano. Another great cover. Just screams 1950s. And I just love the design era of the 1950s. And part of why is the 1950s, that color comes into play. And so you get these beautiful, rich colors that they just seem to know what they were doing. A record I love, one of my favorites, is this Lee Wiley record, Sings Rogers and Hart. Uh, great group on here with Joe Jones, Ruby Braff, Jimmy Jones on the piano. Tough to find this. Uh, you gotta love Lee Wiley. Me and Scott Baldwin were talking about Lee Wiley yesterday. She's really one of the greats of that post-war era. She was a white gal, but she could sing with a lot of soul. But she has a real finite refinement to her sound as well. <clears throat> Number 313, and one of my favorite covers ever. Is Lee Connitz. She's called Connitz uh, Blue Cover. Uh, again, recorded in Boston. I think at Storyville. Ronnie Ball is on the piano. A great pianoism. Great record at Savoy. Uh, Peter Ind is on the bass and Jeff Morton's on the drums. So again, a very nice record. Tough. This one will run you a hundred bucks pretty easily. Then another great Teddy King record here, number three fourteen. And this is Jimmy Jones, Bill Tintin, Ruby Braff. Fantastic stuff. I love that record. Got a great cover. This is a weird, weird one as well. Again, a bit of a folk entry. Rudy Valley's Drinking Songs. Ken Darby and the King's Men. It's like it's what it looks like. Boston drinking music. So it kind of fits in with what Storyville and what he's doing. 
Uh, one of the great kind of forgotten piano players of this era is the black guy Alice Larkin. And I say he's black because there wasn't a lot of black music on Storyville, but Alice was a black guy. I, that's even, I can't even tell if that's him playing there, but uh, he's a great record. Uh, great cover as well, which is absolutely fantastic. The shading, the monochromatism, the fonting of it, it's just all really well done. And Ellis Larkin's work is really great. I'm a big fan of his stuff. And he's someone I got kind of got into last year and really enjoyed discovering his discography. Number 318 is the great Joe Newman, who of course played with Basie for the longest of times. Uh, Newman's a great player on his own. He just brings a lot of energy, a lot of fire, a lot of brightness. Uh, he's one of those storytelling players on the trumpet, and it's always a joyous thing, a celebration. Serge Chaloff, this plays The Fables of Mabel. This is a great record. Uh, one of the most hallmark 10 inches probably in this series, along with the Lee Conant stuff. Great stuff. Great cover. Great modern post-bop. Modern jazz. Uh, Wild Bill, Pee Wee, and Vic. Uh, Wild Bill Davison's on the organ, if I recall. No, it's on the trumpet. It said Wild. There's a Wild Bill Davison and a Wild Bill Davison. And then you got Pee Wee Russell on the, on the clarinet and Vic Dickinson. Another great little 10 inch, another great album cover. Ruby Braff, number 320. It's a fairly common uh, picture you see when someone talks about story, but they often show you that cover. Uh, there's also a 7 inch with a slightly different color to it with the same image. Uh, Ruby's a great player as well. Another great, somewhat New Orleans tradition player, but can play very modern at times as well. Uh, Ruby Brass is a guy you can get for a real steal off, and, and don't pass him up if you have a chance. Uh, Jackie and Roy are a great singing, uh, jazz singing couple. Uh, they make records at a lot of labels over the years. Uh, this is one of their early ones at Storyville number 322. They skip a few numbers in that area. And then number 323, again, a fantastic Lee Connitz at Harvard Square. And the cover is just fantastic on that. This is Ronnie Ball, Jeff Morton, and Peter In once again. Beautiful artwork. Goldblatt just knows how to do what he's doing. So we're going to move on to the LP sessions now. Give me one sec here. So along with the whole industry, in 1955 or so, the 12 inch LP takes the place of the 10 inch LP. And the big labels like DECA, Columbia, they've already been doing the LP for a couple of years. The small labels had to worry about their inventory, their stock, their bottom line, their margins and their profits were much more limited. So their ability just to switch over midstream was much more, much diminished. And so labels like Blue Note, Prestige, Storyville, they had to finish out the stock of 10 inches they had before they made that switch. And some of that almost drove these labels out of business. Because while they're still trying to run their 10 inch stock, they're still distributing records that are kind of old hat now. And it's like selling eight tracks once the LP came or the cassette tape came out. It was just like hard to sell that stuff now. And it kills some labels. And there is a gap kind of between the, the 10 inch era and the LP era with some labels are just, it's one of the, an extinction event. It kills some labels of that era, for sure. And a lot of other labels barely squeak through. The big labels never seem to mind these changes happening because they can adapt. They have the bottom line to do so. <clears throat> so a lot of those early 901, we go to the 900 series now, and this is two of Conant's records called together, 901. Uh, 902 is the two Bechet records I don't have called together. Again, I don't have those any of those three. 903 is like another great Teddy King record. This record's outstanding. The cover art is outstanding. Bert Goldblatt kills it. The band on here kills it. Billy Taylor, Bobby Brookmeyer, Nick Travis, Mill Tenton, Saul Schlinger, and Gene Quill, along with O.C. Johnson. It's a fantastic, fantastic record by a great singer that a lot of people kind of have forgotten about. Jackie and Roy, number 904, another great obsession by those guys. Some of that 10 inch stuff might be on here if I can't remember. 905 is Feel Like a New Man by Joe Newman, more of the great Joe Newman, who again, great cover. It's not a Goldblatt if I remember, which surprised me because it certainly has a Goldblatt aesthetic, but it's, 
uh, someone by Lively. I'm not sure who. Messing around in Mont Montmartre. Mary Lou Williams with Don Bias. Uh, Alvin Banks and Gerard Pocono. Uh, Potion Ape. Lively does the cover again. Side two is Buck Clayton. Great album cover. The great Storyville logo on the vinyl. Again, a record that's fairly tough to come by. Uh, more great Zoot Sims and Bob Brookmeyer together. And those two played together often over the years. Tonight's music today. Great cover, great session. Uh, it's an important chapter of jazz. Ruby Raff, hustling and bustling. I think some of this is 10 inch stuff. I think some of this is other session stuff. I'm guessing this is also that Lively character. Yes, it is. I'm not sure who Lively is, so if someone knows, put it in the comments. Uh, this is probably Lively once again. No, it's Goldblatt again. We're in the money. Ruby Russell. And I think some of this is from 10 inch. Again, some of it's unreleased stuff. Great album cover. Number 910 is a tough record to find by uh, Miss Millie Vernon. Tough record to come by. And this is a case of a record I bought from a guy who won like 150 for it. <clears throat> I think I ended up giving him 60 because of the condition it was in. <clears throat> and when it showed up, it was in way worse condition than that. It's playable, but it, it's not, doesn't sound great. I'd like to replace this someday, but I have the cover. I'm not sure who does this cover. It's an interesting cover. She's got a nice voice. And there's a collection coming up of the women on Storyville where some of the stuff is on there. So at least I have some of the tracks that play really nicely. Uh, this is Dualog. Again, this is two 10 inches, if I remember. And the Lee Wiley sees Rogers and Hart 10 inch, and then the Ellis Larkin 10 inch. But it's a cool cover. I found it from Japan for probably six, eight bucks, so I grabbed it just to fill the sequence in. <clears throat> Toshiko. Toshiko Akiyoshi, the fantastic Japanese player. She's fantastic. She has a record, I think, after this at Metro Jazz. And then she has these two records I hear on Storyville. And she's just, of course, George Wien introduces her. Uh, George Wien marries an African American woman by the name of Joyce Alexander. And uh, <clears throat> so you really get the feeling that George is an ambassador for females, minorities, immigrants. Uh, all those liberal art people have an empathy through understanding of the various groups on this planet. But George marries this black lady, of course. I believe Wikipedia said a Gentile of African-American descent which is a fun play on the uh, Jewish viewpoint of world sociology. But uh, he, they started this uh, endowment and the George and Joyce Ween collection of African-American art. And so you're just seeing these guys really cherish and find value in the art that minorities do. In spite of it being kind of a white dominated label, <clears throat> they're definitely in key and in tune with the minorities that are supporting this music and making it happen. And uh, part of the whiteness of Storyville is a reflection of Boston itself. It's a, it's a very white city, especially in the 50s compared to today. You know, immigration's changed a lot of America in the last 70 years, obviously. Uh, Boston's an interesting little case in point. It has its own history, it's very unique and very different from New York, just down the road. You know, in New England, it's its own little slice of America, but any question about it. <clears throat> he also ends up doing the Newport Folk Festival, a very important festival. He helps start in New Orleans, a great jazz festival and heritage festival there. He's helping create the Playboy Jazz Festival in Los Angeles. In 05, he wins the Jazz Master Award for the National Endowment of the Arts. So he's got a, a very well-storied career. What we're listening to right now is Jordan Ween presents uh, Ellis Larkin's Do Nothing Till You Hear From Me. She's the great piano player doing Ellington stuff. Uh, this is a treasure. This is a great record. Uh, you got to love players doing Ellington in their own little way, but still paying homage to the great Duke as they do it. It's a great record worthy of finding. 
One of the last ones I found was this 914. Zut Sims, Bill Brookmeyer, Joe Jones, Hank Jones, and Bill Crow. And the name is Wee! And you know that because at the end of one of the tunes, maybe it's the beginning of one of the tunes, one of them in the studio, or maybe it's live, I think, goes Wee! And that becomes the name of the album. <clears throat> and so now I know how to say it too. Sing, sing, baby. Jackie and Roy. More of those two. Number 915. Number 916 is the women in jazz. And we're kind of getting towards the end of the Storyville legacy right here. This is a collection of Akiyoshi and the other gal singers like Wiley and uh, Millie Vernon called together. It's like a, a collection of the women artists. And then this is again Akiyoshi, her trio and quartet, again from Japan. Domestic presses of these Akiyoshi records are just about impossible to find. Whether it's because they didn't sell well, or because collectors don't part with them, or because the Japanese came and brought them all back to Japan, or a combination of all of the above, original Akiyoshi records on Storyville are just about impossible to get here in America. So I bought them both from Japan for probably 25 bucks. Great player, she really is. And she ends up marrying Charlie Mariano, who was one of my favorite players of the era as well. As you can see, I got a nice little sweat going. The humidity's already cranking up here. So, aside from this record I showed you already, the Woman, Wine, and Song, he's also doing stuff like this on Atlantic Newport Jazz Festival. He actually plays some of this group on the piano. Uh, on Bethlehem, number 6050, so towards the end of the Bethlehem run, this is Metronome Presents Jazz of the Modern, George Ween and the Storyville Sextet. So he still has the club open by the looks of it. Uh, with Harold Shorty Baker, Tyree Glenn, P.B. Russell, quite a little record. Uh, even on Impulse, George Ween and the Newport All-Stars. All <clears throat> so again, he's showing up in a lot of places. And he's not just some white guy that's getting token records, the guy can play. He's got even a great element of soul, and what he lacks for in struggle, he makes up for an empathy for those who struggle. And that's one of the great balancing acts. If, even if you haven't struggled greatly, if you have enough understanding and you have empathy for struggle, <clears throat> it can still give you that element of soul that's needed. So that's today's episode. I hope you all appreciate that. Uh, if you want to buy some merchandise to help you support getting this coffee shop open, look in the description below. We always appreciate it. If you want to donate to the Patreon page and help support the channel as well, that's always appreciated. Y'all be safe, stay cool. I need to go run a layer of sweat off by jumping in the pool out back. It's going to mess with my ears some more, but it's a, it's a struggle. First class world struggle. I'm living it. Y'all be safe. Love y'all. Peace.